Why do some brands fail miserably while others succeed when expanding into new territories, new markets? That was the main topic of my interview with Talia Zayed, who's a senior brand and retail strategist who's been in the market for over 20 years and has some serious knowledge when it comes to brand, retail, and market expansion, especially when it comes to heritage brands. In this interview, uh, Dahlia talks about her experience and she really brings uh, some, some real examples of companies that had to uh, adjust not only uh, their product, but also the mindset. Uh, especially of the leadership when tapping into new markets. So uh, this interview was really filled with uh, incredible knowledge, practical examples, and I hope you enjoy it because I really enjoyed this one. Um, this podcast and interview is part of the Evolve Commerce Club, which is a community I run. We have events every Thursday. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a link in, in, in the description below. And if you're curious, you can sign up because every Thursday we have a session with, with an expert like Dahlia. All right. Now, uh, I hope you enjoy, uh, enjoy the session and don't forget to leave a like and share it with uh, your, your, your community. Wishing you all the best and see you then. Hello everyone, this is Carlos again for another Evolve Talks, part of our Evolve Commerce Club. And today I have the honor to be hosting Dalia Zayed, who's someone that I high, highly admire. She has an incredible background. She's been working um, in the multinational space for over 20 years, working with uh, massive brands. Um, one of them was, uh, the, at, at her last role was at Mondelez, uh, leading Global Insights for about four and a half years. Uh, we had a, uh, a live conversation with Dahlia, which was fantastic, had about 15 people in the room, but it was a new software and I made the mistake of not recording it. <laughs> so Dahlia, my apologies, but uh, welcome again. And we are recording like this one-to-one -one conversation today. It was an incredible conversation that we had on Thursday, uh, the 9th, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you for this. Uh, let's get started. I always start all of my episodes with the same question, which is the big picture. Who's Dahlia and how did we get here? Well, um, I'm more than happy to be back with Evolve, uh, regardless of the, you know, boo-boo on the recording, absolutely fine. But yeah, I mean, uh, technology sometimes uh, does not really work for us. So anyway, I mean, just a small reflection on on Thursday. I think the um, the audience, um, I, I was really impressed by their questions. They're pretty senior and really hands-on. These guys know uh, their issues in their markets and, and it was pretty diversified. I mean, we, we, we had Brazil, Romania, uh, some people from Europe and from Egypt and so forth and Turkey. Uh, so that that was really a, a fun evening. I really enjoyed it. So I, I don't mind uh, recapping a little bit of what we discussed. Uh, so I did, as you said, uh, 20 years of uh, multinational, last of which was um, uh, focused on chocolate specifically. I was between Zurich and Dubai with Mondelez International Handling Strategy, Consumer and Shopper Insights. Um, I was happy and um, let's say lucky enough to go through a lot of the uh, launches like uh, Cadbury, Bubbly, and Marvel's Creations, creating them from scratch with uh, the R&D team in, in the UK and Zurich. I, I personally learned a lot at that phase. I left and uh, since like eight years now, I have my own consultancy. The passion for me, to be honest, I, I focus on uh, brand strategy and retail in the Middle East uh, and Africa region. The passion is really for heritage brands that I I personally grew on in, in Egypt and then I, I saw the same pattern in, in the region whereby uh, these are family owned businesses, but they have not moved on. They have this little, you know, tricks and, you know, tips if you want that, you know, they can step change the game and be as competitor as the multinationals and indeed have global brands that can, you know, spread 
And um, hence, since then, I've just, you know, dedicated my time for that as a consultant, but also as a public speaker on brand and retail. I mean, uh, if if anybody interested in more, I, I have links to my, um, uh, you know, work reel on the YouTube. Um, I specifically chose this. I had a, I had an issue with the with the I don't know what. So I you said that the name of the game the game is growth. Um, I think the first step I like uh, the first thing I like to start here, Dalia, is um, understanding why brands. What are the what are the challenges that heritage brands face when when going abroad? Uh, typical challenge that you see when when they are starting their international expansion and why do you think it's important to to go abroad to you know to take the next step and 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 expand your business abroad well i i mean i i want to you know um dissect this into two types of clients the 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 family businesses and the multinationals i'm not going to, to talk about multinationals they have their own game and that's fine uh, family businesses or large local organizations, um, in many ways, um, those on top, which is really the first generation, second generation, and so forth, they sort of, you know, uh, let the train pass them, you know. Um, there's so much uh, new trends happening, uh, consumer uh, insights, changing behaviors, and so forth. One, one, one thing I have noticed is that... Um, First thing, uh, when they say growth, they think externally, which is absolutely fine. And we're going to speak about this, of course. But I think in many ways, they miss a, 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 an internal lens that they can look into in parallel. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So uh, uh, efficiencies in procurement, operations, uh, are, are, do they have the right talent or they just, you know, they're having an operation managers that have been there for like uh, 35 years. I mean, no offense, seriously, but things do change, even the style of management and, and leadership. And if you want to attract talent and we only win through people, it's not just technology and so forth or product or brand. And speaking of brand, it could be the case that you have a fantastic brand, mm -hmm. but the product itself has not evolved much. There is not in, uh, enough innovation or you have not looked into new consumer segments. Uh, I recall working on Cadbury Dairy Milk uh, in South Africa. I think this this fantastic campaign in 2013 and, and please look into the advertising. It's called the triplets uh, at that time. And, and Cadbury is a huge brand. We were, were, were really having a barrier with uh, um, lower SECs uh, specifically. Uh, blank uh, single moms. Yeah, they were not eating chocolate. There is an affordability part of it, of course. So what we've did, we did this campaign, but also we launched the right SQ, the right size, the 40 gram that could be affordable for that need state. And we grew the brand further. You know, it's not like because you're a big brand, you just sit there and, and do nothing uh, uh, about it and so forth. Uh, even if you're a B2B uh, brand, let's say you're a construction company, uh, you literally, you know, offer cement, but maybe today in your own local market, people want a, a turnkey solution. They want, you know, give them the building or the compound or whatever with all the, the wiring and the security and all of that, you know, a, a turnkey solution. Because remember today, customers, whether they're companies in B2B space or customers, uh, consumers, okay, they want solutions. They want convenience. Mm -hmm. OK, that is the name of, of the game in that respect. Um, in terms of external markets, um, one of the things or the key question that I always get asked is, um, are markets different or similar? The answer to that mm -hmm. is actually both. It's similar and different. So um, it's not a quiz or a puzzle. I'll, I'll tell you the answer now. So at a human level, let's look at the um, life cycle of human beings. Yeah. So take, for example, teenagers. Yeah. Teenagers in India, Brazil, uh, South Africa, Germany, Egypt or whatever. And, and these are all markets I've, I've done research work in. Uh, 
A teenager has the same attitude. So teenagers wants to challenge the status quo, the rules, their parents. They want to find their voice. They're, they're confused about their identity. It's just... Uh, and of course, they're 24-7 uh, uh, on their mobiles. They have their own little circle that they consult for what, what they, they buy and so forth. The thing is, they're the same attitude, but the way they manifest that is different based on the social economic class, how much money they have, okay, pocket money and the culture and the way they were raised. So they would still want to play uh, games like Xbox or PlayStation. He could have like the savvy latest version at home in, in, uh, in, in his room with his friends playing, or you go to the neighborhood little club where, you know, you can just pay a, a very little fee, but the, the, the sensation, the occasion is the same. And, you know, the bonding with, with, with friends. Um, I, I would, I would also relate to, um, other consumer segments. So let's say moms, um, funny enough from, from, you know, the countries I've worked in, I worked in Yemen. And Yemen is one of the poorest countries in the world and they have war and whatever. But believe it or not, in, in the world of, of, of snacking and, and food and beverage, there is a neat state called Mito moment for uh, women. Yeah. So uh, moms. When the, uh, sorry, can you come again? Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, that's the me moment. I, I, I just, yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. So yeah, me moment. So this is where, you know, you, you sort of, you know, uh, done with your responsibilities. So a woman in, in Yemen, by the time, you know, the husband goes to work, the kids go to 10 a.m. in the morning for her, that's the me moment. And she consumes shai, which is tea with milk, traditional uh, Yemeni one. This equates uh, a glass of wine for a German mom at uh, 9 or 10 uh, p.m. in the evening. It's the same need. It's the same feelings. So the question is, what kind of category and what what brand you're going to use to fulfill that need and this is where markets are different so we spoke about consumers the needs are the same but now as a company going into a market the market structure is different yeah the 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 type of portfolio you're going to launch would be different yeah and competitive context now, I, I, I want to stop at competitive context for a minute because it's 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 always been, I don't know, it, it, it's a funny thing because I go into clients and ask them, I mean, in a briefing, I mean, they, they want to hire me as a consultant, we're just chit-chatting. So I ask them like, who is your competitor? And like 80%, they would just answer the, the you know, head on. So if it's Pepsi, it's Coke. No, it's not like that. You are competing in the space of refreshment. Yeah, everything else comes in. And whether you're going uh, uh, out of your country or you're staying, you need to uh, uh, revise who your competitive context is. Yeah, I, I mean, years back when I started working on, on snacking, the number one snack in the world is a fruit, okay? Today, you have up to, uh, you know, those quick, instant, uh, on-the-go noodles. This is a snack. Okay? So if you're a snacking company, you probably need to look at all of these because they're all competing for the same share of pockets, share of wallet for that shopper. And everybody around the world are, are really sensing the inflammation. Um, sorry, the inflation. <laughs> Okay, the inflation and everybody is, is going on a budget, more or less. Yeah. So what type of SKU and uh, product you're going to, to launch at which price point, which really takes us to the market structure. Now, we are lucky in, in a lot of ways, people who are practicing today versus years back, that we have a lot of data. So it, the category has a curve. Yeah, it starts somewhere and ends somewhere. That evolution is the work of uh, a lot of R&D, innovation, and all of these multinationals that, you know, built in how to grow the category and, you know, have different segments and products. So if we're talking dairy, for example, and again, going back to my, my Yemen work, um, 
I had uh, facilitated a lot of innovation uh, workshops. One of them was on yogurt. So yogurt in Yemen is just plain. And if you look and they have like, you know, some activia coming in from Saudi Arabia. So maybe the digestion need state is, is a little bit built there. But let's take the uh, extreme side of the curve and look into Denmark or the Netherlands. You go to the fridge and it's like absolutely crazy, you know, different um, claims, whether it's protein, lactose free, different sizes, uh, flavors, mixes, you know, granolas with uh, uh, yogurt. This is the freak, uh, you know, the breakfast treat on the go, da, 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 and the packaging is definitely very simulating and, and functional and, and pretty. So at, at this workshop and looking at what are the possibilities from a product po concept point of view, which is it that we go to launch after plane? The usual curve would tell you that it's a uh, fruit yogurt, but then this is indulging and this is a poor country. This is a mom that wants to make better choices for her family and kids um maintenance of their health so probably a product with functional benefits would be better like you know added uh, vi uh vitamin d for example or added ca uh, calcium so that that was the the choice in that respect and then you make choices around the sku size whether it's volume driven so you get bigger sizes or um you know affordability in 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 india for example we had tang that was one of the brands I worked on as well, uh, sachets. Uh, Unilever had sun silk uh, shampoo in little sachets as well, you know, for affordability. And you make these choices. Uh, you don't have to be a, a big brand or a multinational as long as you understand how does that work. Um, I think possibly, uh, and going back to your question about challenges, one of the things I've, I've noticed, and I, I think most people who work with expert associations have this traditional thinking of what export is. To me, there is something called expert and then there's entry strategy. And I'll, 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 I'll share with you the difference. So expert is, you know, uh, have a logo, decent packaging, put a container and that's it. And, you know, say good luck to your product. You know, it's on shelf, whether it sells or not, you know, good luck. And then there is a, a level that is, I think, mainstream, which I'm sort of okay-ish with. It's like 60% of the volume goes out of a country uh, by, you know, you're visiting the trade and looking at boards and, you know, uh, uh, having meetings with local distributors, handshake uh, an agreement, and, and you're there. Uh, you could do some trade marketing, you know, high-level stuff. I mean, sales are not guaranteed, to be honest, because you have not built a brand specifically if, you know, uh, um, it's consolidated between two or three big players and you're like, you know, number six or seven. If you're fragmented, probably you can win some of these shares from the smaller players and get into like a, a eight to, to 10 percent, depends on the category. I would not advocate for a, a price war because you will always have somebody who's cheaper. So it goes down to build a brand. And this is more of a long-term strategy. And this is what I, I, I do and support clients to do that. Once you get maybe into uh, post-trade kind of distributor model, you look into the country and you say, yes, there is future potential there. Maybe I should invest in co-manufacturing or acquisition of a local player or doing my own manufacturing and, and so forth. And, and the way I see it, and it's, it's very efficient, at least that's, that's what I do with my clients, is look at the world in clusters. Uh, so uh, recently I just finished a, a local client. They are into makeup, again, a heritage brand. And uh, we looked into six uh, countries to export. That's a, the export strategy. Um, I looked into West Africa and East Africa and I had uh, Kenya uh, as a center point. And then if Kenya wins, then I'm supporting all the countries in, in, in Eastern Africa. Same thing uh, for, for West, I, I chose Nigeria. 
uh, North Africa, uh, you know, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, they're, they're different because they're, they're French speaking and they have a different culture. South, South Africa is the same. For, for the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia is contained. You know, it's a really big chunk on its own. Turkey is on its own and the Gulf on its own. The reason is there is proximity. Uh, that's one thing. And there is um, uh, language is very important and, and the culture as well to understand. Once you establish yourself in one, always look at the potential that the countries uh, around them will be part of, um, you know, the win, the win, the, the, the prize, because, you know, looking at strategy between three to five years, you need to understand where the money is coming from and uh, the size of the prize, because it's a really uh, big investment. So um, I don't know if, if, if you have more questions on that. I, I, I think on yeah. uh, uh, Thursday, yeah, we touched upon route to market, but I, I, I mentioned specifically two points. One I'm passionate about, which is D2C, which is direct to consumer when you have your own mm -hmm. retailer, because this is the way you um, have the ability to uh, tell the story of the brand and engage shoppers. And, and this is probably for more of premium niche brands. I, I love this model. The other thing we spoke about is private label and private label is absolutely huge. It's, it's double digit. And just to give you perspective in grocery, for example, latest research would tell you in Europe, the shopping basket um, of own store brand is uh, five out of 10 and expected to be between seven and eight and comes down to the equity of the retail brand. But if you on the other side, you can grow out of your market if you have capacity of production and you have, you know, articulate uh, uh, operations because these uh, retailers like, you know, uh, Spar, Aldi, um, you know, you have it, they, they, they're all huge and they have uh, very, are very, very demanding on specs that is coming to them, whether from a product perspective or a packaging perspective. So um, there you go. That's like my five cents for the day on growth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I love it. And as you were talking, to, I mean, you, you, you touched some very, very interesting points. You spoke about culture and understanding, I mean, like you, you Something you said here that I thought it was very interesting. Visit a house, home, open the fridge, and you understand culture, right? Like uh, about the kind of like uh, that country and how they how they purchase and how let's say they are. Uh, I wouldn't say advanced, but uh, more wealthy or or whatever needs they might have just by visiting a, a home. And in that sense, I have a I have a friend. And my ex brother in law, we're still very close friends. He used to work for it's not a market research, but it was more like a, an advertising agency. But he was working closely with marketing, uh, uh, market research firms here in them. And he would always tell me that Denmark is one of the, the markets um, that brands really like to test their products. Uh, does that, uh, or at least Coke, he, he would say that from a, a Coca Cola perspective, when they have a new launch or something that would test in Denmark first because the, the, the market would react quickly, would give really fast answers. And, and that is something that is always, uh, I, I thought was, it was interesting. I don't know if it was the market size, if it was because it's a small country that is wealthy or, or and whatnot. So I was, I was curious actually to ask you about that, how a market may react to a certain products, give the feedback do the brand and so the brand takes uh, their, their next steps. How, how do you see that? Well, if it's, if it's, I mean, uh, let me rephrase that into uh, leading companies. So in Denmark, for example, one of my, my favorite companies that I, I follow even on a corporate level is Arla. I think that they, they do a lot of good work on that and even educated the market about, about dairy. Uh, so if it's innovation, it's probably a wise idea to, um, you know, test with the most advanced market because they will lead the future. Yeah, that does not mean that other markets are ready for that. And this is where you um, have to make the choice as a big company, which brands at which phase do you want to launch in which country? So this is where, where we call where to play. 
and how to win. So where to play, I cannot do the, the, the savviest kind of dairy innovation uh, in, in, in Africa where it's really still very basic, but probably I can go for a UEE and the Gulf because uh, one, uh, they, they, the bulk is affluent. Uh, the population is mixed between uh, foreigners and local Arabs. And if, if it's a product that is targeting young people, they are totally, totally online. Yeah. And they are into health, if it's a health claim and so forth. Uh, the, the type of product, the packaging, how you market it, which goes into how to win. Okay. So you already have a product, but how will you win and which segment? So I think on, on the basic level of uh, product and innovation, yes, you would go for the most advanced market. But whether you launch it or not in, in different markets, that's really a, a, another exercise that you need to do. Uh, but that goes back, uh, and thank you, uh, but that goes back again to, to the concept of um, personas, which uh, I, I, I don't really like sometimes, uh, or at least in the demographic sense of, of, of when you are analyzing something. For example, we have evolved here. And I do understand the way that we have different people with different needs. So we have former heads of like yourself, now consultants, you have a specific need that we are, we are mapping at Evolve, right? In terms of being a consultant, generating demand, having a stage. And we have people who are still working for a brand or, um, um, or, a, or a technology company and, and, I think when you're when you're like a D2C company, uh, as you're saying, um, I'm just trying to build a parallel here be, uh, between what I've done in, in the B2B space with VTEX, for example, which was a total failure launching VTEX in Denmark because the market here primarily consumed Microsoft. So understanding the ecosystem was very important, whereby when we launched or when we started working with, uh, in Romania, that's how I got to meet Vesna, Bulgaria, those up and coming markets that used uh, Magento, which is an open source platform. I mean, it was a blast and they were ready to understand what Vitex was all about because they were dissatisfied with that player. It was a good fit, uh, but at the time Vitex was definitely not a good fit here in Denmark. It was gonna be an extremely expensive play and no certainty that we would have any success. We actually spent quite a bit of money just to, to try. The, the market had very powerful introductions, but nothing really happened compared to Romania, Bulgaria, or Poland, Italy. Uh, for that, you know, so it's it's really interesting. It's it's another, it's it's tech, but the, understanding the the macro environment, the ecosystem, really, and sure. how things are playing out is really really important. Like whether you're B two B or to see right sure and, and it goes back to the, the the market structure and competitive context that's where it differs as i was saying earlier because uh you are at a market that the benchmark is set by a certain player okay people already consuming it every day whether it's a b2b or b2c doesn't really matter but you know it's the benchmark here in the brain and now if they're satisfied or not satisfied, that's a different story. But the player that is coming into the market needs to realize that they are not going from scratch, from zero. No, they are entering a market where already there is a player and, and people are set. They, they set the benchmarks on it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's like Apple when, when they launched, they set a new benchmark about, you know, convenience and how the the software is how the uh, uh, you know iPod can you know put uh, your music in playlists and then that word playlist was was really very new but it came from the need that you know uh, music lovers want their music to be organized it's, it's as simple as that now the sky's the limit if, if by default any music application has to have a, a playlist there see what i mean so it, it really depends on that brand uh, where it plays now the thing i would tell you is that i found also there's a lot of brands that have ego and and most mm -hmm. likely that would be in more of family uh, uh, owned 
but in multinationals as well you i i i, I went into many many um you know meetings global meetings and you know the data is there and the discussions but somebody has so much faith in the brand and i i don't i'm not saying don't love your brand of course you should be proud of them but you know that does not mean that even if you're a global brand you can conquer the world you know when when i i launched oreo in egypt and we had this oreo is a is a, is a hundred plus year old uh, american brand it, it builds on the twist lick and dunk uh, ritual which was built a hundred years ago so the question is is this a positioning that we can take globally and build it yeah mm -hmm. so that was really one of those you know back and forth discussions forever okay so it was sort of yes it was launched on on the on the play and it, it worked a little bit but you know what made oreo fly is the heritage and and people in the middle east know oreo i mean since forever and they were happy to have it it, and the product is good. You know, you, you don't forget your basic credential. At the end of the day, your food, you are put in the mouth. You mothers are giving it to their children. It tastes good. Yeah. So the, the production was good. The quality was good. Distribution was good. Good price point. So you ticked all the basic hygiene of any launch. And then, okay, well, we can't play around the global positioning. So yeah. We had a little bit of fun. And now, uh, uh, if you check any of the um, advertising in the Middle East about Oreo, it's actually about having fun within a family context. Because, you know, in the Middle East, family is extremely, extremely important. And I would say in most developing countries in, in the South, you, 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 you would relate to this. So India, Brazil, South Africa, and so forth. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, family is not important in Europe or the US, but it's like, it's an integral part so most advertising would be around that family moment of sharing something. Okay. So you will find all the campaigns in the last three years for Oreo in, in this region is around, you know, uh, empowering family to get together over a fun activity, which is twist link and dunk. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and yeah. yes, I, I would, you know, also add on an earlier point you've mentioned, if, if you're looking at customers, Please do not look at demographics. This is this this is trash. Literally, it's all about attitude and behavior. And if you're talking about research, I would advocate 100% for observational research. You know, people say something and do something else. You know, I do a lot of work in that area, behavior research and neuromarketing, and I can tell you that it's it's you know eye opener. Um, absolutely. Versus, you know, just asking one on one. If if you go to the store, I mean, you, you you spoke about example of opening the fridge. Let me tell you another exercise that, that you can do. If you're standing in line in a, in a big supermarket or a hyper uh, uh, at the cashier, just look at the trolley in front of you or, or after you and look at the person who is buying the shopper and the items they have, whether the items themselves or the size or the brand or everything. That shopping trolley says a lot about the person, you know, whether he's the, the main user, he's mm -hmm. the shopper, he's the decision maker. Oh, totally. And yes, 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 it's spot on. And even the, you know, the not the big ones, the top, uh, you know, on the go, uh, top up mission, as we call it. So you you forgot the the milk and the bread, you, you just go, you know, quickly, I'll pick those up or whatever. And you probably have a, a snack at the, the, the checkout for your kid or for yourself, just a little bit of candy or chocolate. It's all the same behavior. <laughs> I've done a lot of shopper work. I mean, it, it just, it's just amazing. So observe, please. That's my advice for you. Uh, I can see how passionate you are about it. And it's, it's really exciting <laughs> to talk to you about this because they're... <laughs> No, 100%. I'm telling you, like I told you about my family business on Thursday, uh, things that, I mean, um, uh, even at Evolve, and I'll bring this topic again, because what what what, what we are trying to build here to co to create this this community, I, you know, like there is a there is a community called Mac Alliance. And four years ago, I was challenged by a, a friend uh, who's a decision maker here in Poland, in Poland, sorry. Who said maybe you should try to create something like Mac? And I said, okay, Mac Alliance. They they're congregating uh, this this community of is super corporate nowadays. They started during the pandemic, 
but it's for CIOs and CTOs who uh, want to be educated around composable commerce. Composable commerce are basically these technologies that work as the building, blo building blocks of e-commerce. So it's, it's a bit technical. And I've always thought that uh, commerce, it's, it's, it's way more complex. It's, it's just not, a, it's, it's not only for CIOs and CTOs who are signing the check, but it's for people like you who do understand about consumers, it's for people who understand about logistics, it's for people who understand about uh, different generations. And so it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it is a complex, you know, it's a, it's a wider spectrum. Uh, and I, of course, I do, I, do, I do have more people who are consultants because I do understand their needs very well. But trying to build this uh, category of, let's say, one, uh, it's, it's something that it's, it's really challenging, but I find it really exciting because what I'm trying to do here, I, I haven't seen in the market, you know, trying to connect the international needs in the world of commerce because um, it's something I lived uh, as a as a foreigner in Denmark, uh, helping uh, companies expand internationally. So that is the segue for my next question, which is how do you build a category of one? Yesterday I was seeing the guy who created OpenAI. He was talking about um, how they address the smallest consumer segment. And from there, they always saw big successes. And when they try to address a big, big consumer segment, they always failed because they couldn't, uh, let's say, niche in, in one specific segment, you know, uh, of, of, of needs. I don't know if, if you understand what I'm trying to ask here. Or if I'm um, um, okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit challenging, but I, I, th I think the key word here is segmentation because, you know, you, you can't mm -hmm. sell everything to everyone. It doesn't really work. Yeah, right. unless you're into commodities, which is like, you know, it has a, a, a different sort of, you know, you're not pasta, you're not rice. Okay, so uh, you need mm. to, to understand very well this, the, the segment that you're going to launch with. Okay, but then always in the setup and I, I, I because I work with investors as well, whether they want to enter the market through acquisition or build a new brand. And I always start with uh, the bigger umbrella, even the name. The name should, should be wide enough to encompass any future investment or any other category that, that you can do that. I mean, as, as simple as a friend of mine, uh, um, she, she wants to do like a, a gym, blah, 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 and she wants to call it hers. And I said, maybe in the future you want to include males or family business you know like a, a center for every all the family can you know uh do recreational work not just sports why are you limited your, you, yourself from the launch with a, a a gender oriented kind of name i mean that sounds like very you know narrow-minded and believe it or not big companies do that as well so uh, to me there is there are two things start with a bigger umbrella in terms of name and the vision and then start segmenting what is the, the biggest opportunity now because I have the portfolio that can cater for the needs of these. And this is what we call the core segment. And there is something called we, we call the spillover segment, which is likely to be the next uh, uh, set of consumers that once they are uh, they heard about this this product and they're happy with it, you have built a brand, you know, there's a level of engagement because I mean, go back to the basics of building a brand yeah the, the basics there's there's this funnel which we start with awareness uh, uh engagement trial and then usage and then recommendation you know it's a very long journey i mean if you want to be a, a true brand in that market not just a product whereby uh, another competitor comes in with a better packaging and and lower pricing you just engage in that and and probably more of uh tech and b2b uh, it's it's challenging and you need to be very uh, careful the type of products and services that that you will offer versus you know just mainstream fast moving consumer goods i don't know if that helps in any way yeah no it, it helps a lot and i just uh while you were actually it was about 10 minutes ago I, I opened a tab here because i think it has a lot to do with what you're saying so you identify a main like so you have the umbrella, as you said, and then you identify the main segment and you, you, was, you use the word called spill segment, which is like potential yeah. future opportunities. So this article from 
or by the drum, I, I really like the drum, uh, talks about uh, some brands that are stretching into new categories. And then apparently uh, to, to Tobasco now is offering a quick alcoholic drink, kind of like a, what do you call Bloody Mary uh, with some, some Tobasco. And other brands that are uh, starting to play into new categories. Uh, so Greg's, which is very popular in the UK, they had this cheap sausage roll. Now they launched their own beer. So I find this fascinating. Uh, you know, so they're trying to capture what you said in the beginning of our talk, that share of wallet. While the consumer is there, they might also, right? Yeah. Try to, um, let me uh, let me actually build on that because it's it's a uh, it's a very important point, Carlos, and it's it's one of the points. I mean, I did, I mean, I know this is a, a short encounter, but it's it's I have a longer session on 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 growth, and one of the the, the points I, I share is about brand stretch. How stretchable is your brand? Yeah, and and this goes by uh, even the name at the beginning, okay, and the equity and the kind of communication that you've done from the start. Always have a, a, a bigger vision. Where can I grow? I mean, we, we had a, a there's so many uh, good examples and bad examples. So Detol, for example, uh, which is known for this bacterial soap kind of thing, launched shampoo. Do you want to have that bacterial thing in your head? And they're, they're promoting it mainstream shampoo. To me, it's more of something that you buy at the pharmacy because you have an issue and you want something like that. Uh, Dove, believe it or not, in the U.S., uh, like, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, and Dove is known for this, uh, you know, creamy on the hands and soft, da, 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 okay. They launched in the U.S. a dishwasher liquid that is branded Dove. It failed miserably because the point is you need to ask yourself, do you have the right to win in this category? You know, if, if you're uh, selling, I don't know, uh, rice and then you venture into shampoo, I mean, you know, see what I mean? This is the, this is the first. For Duff, for example, the, the, the woman needs to know that it will actually remove stains and then it's nice to, to be soft on my, my, my hands, okay? So, again, it goes back to miscalculation from brands. It goes back to ego. Sometimes the claim does, does not really uh, stretch. There's, there's, there, it's a science, by the way, which is something I help with with uh, my, my clients, is it stretchable or not? I mean, the, the, the Tabasco example is really very uh, cute because you know, you're know you going through uh, the cocktail segment, okay? So instead of, you know, people already know about uh, Bloody Mary, so why don't I help them out and, you know, because Tabasco is a component of, of that. See what I mean? It's It fits the, 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 the mindset. I mean, it doesn't mind, take a lot yeah. of from the customer to, uh, you know, put in the, the, the links. This is much, much easier than just launching an innovation out of the blue. But it's it's an excellent point, uh, Carlos. And, you know, I, I have so much to, to say on it, but I, I think we, we probably uh, ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, we, we did, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, uh, but I'm sure, I mean, we will do some, some panels if you're up, to, up for it, like with uh, people in the world of commerce, different backgrounds. I'd love to do something with you and Vesna, I know, and, and iTunes as well, some, some, some discussion that we could prepare uh, about a certain topic. I know you, you are all uh, masterminds and, 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 <laughs> and yeah. friends as well, so that would be fun. Uh, so the first thing, I, yeah, I, I, would have some, I would have more to, to ask you, but let's, let's, let's call it uh, for, for the day. Um, how, how, how can people find you, Dalia? I'd love to promote your work. Uh, you can tell me about your, your practice. I'll put it in the show notes on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, so just go ahead and this is your time, please. Well, if you want to build brands go glow and, and grow your brands, whether you're a current brand and you're having difficulty, we can work on the portfolio and optimize it, uh, relaunch the communication and route to market. If it's a, a brand new, uh, whether brand, uh, category, uh, market, I'm, I'm there to help you. And, and strategy is strategy. I mean, even the, the bulk of my work is fast moving consumer goods, but think about it. it. Strategy is about the thinking process. And this is where I come in and, and support you on that. I mean, uh, just reach out on, on LinkedIn and, and connect. 
and um, or watch my YouTube uh, channel, FWD Consulting. And that's about it. I mean, thanks for the forum and I hope uh, it was useful uh, pointers to grow. Very useful. Uh, lovely talk. Second time in the same week uh, or on the same week. So <laughs> it was great. Uh, great talking, Dalia. And I will make sure we will promote this. I, I, I think it's it, this is a fascinating topic. I'm not an expert, but I'm very curious about it. So thanks for this. And I'm sure people will, will enjoy it very much in our network. Yeah. Fantastic. Have a lovely day, Carlos. Ciao. All right. Uh, just a moment. I will end this session and then can I catch you on? Let me just. Oh, I'll pause it. I'll pause it. Perfect.